My name is Dylan Field, CEO and co-founder of Figma. My name is Einat Gez, CEO and co-founder of Papaya Global. Hi, I'm Amit Bendov, CEO and co-founder of Gong.io. Hi, I'm Bernadette Nixon, CEO of Algolia. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today for Cloud 100 and for this conversation. So it's certainly, if you look at 2022, it's certainly been a crucible year for all cloud companies. And I also think for leaders and teams to showcase their potential and the vision and what lies ahead. I think that's so crucial for teams uh, in this climate. So why don't we jump in with our first question? So certainly we've all been SaaS leaders in bull markets and bear markets. Um, but it was interesting to share how some of our priorities are shifting as we take a look at these headwinds. So um, maybe Ainet, could you start us off? How are things shifting for you guys? Yeah, so 2022 is an interesting year, obviously, after a quite few years that each one of them has been interesting by, uh, by herself. But I think that my kind of three rules for these years is first, be very pragmatic. Uh, second, be, be very brave, uh, right? Because I mean, at the end of the day, the decision that I take and each one of us are taking our, our own decisions will impact our company. So be brave, be willing to stand behind them. And the third is what I call the trolley exercise. So, I mean, we all start when we want to kind of travel and we all start with quite a lot of things that we want to package. But if we want to fit to a carry on, we need to assure that we can take everything that is essential and crit critical um, and uh, fit the luggage. So it's kind of the same currently. I mean, it's making again like critical decisions uh, trying uh, to invest in the future from one hand, but also reduce the cost of everything that is not super critical for the business. Yeah, Bernadette, I mean, I think there's early stage issues that we all face, and one of them is certainly category creation, and it's really convincing a market that they need the problem, uh, the solution to the problem that you're selling. So I'm curious for you looking back, uh, what's something that you feel you got right from the very start? And also, what's something that you got completely wrong? Yeah, there, there are definitely examples in both categories. Um, <laughs> I think probably for all of us, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So from us, from our perspective at Algolia, from day one, we focused on being a horizontal API product and platform. And in the early days when Nicolas Desange and Julien Lemoyne, our two co-founders, were um, you know, incubating the idea and as part of the accelerator that they were part of, there were a lot of naysayers. People were giving them advice, you know what, you need to pick a vertical. And everybody was saying, go for e-commerce. But they stuck to their guns and they, they stuck with building out a horizontal um, API first platform that was focused on delivering a great developer experience. And it was a it was a crucial decision for the company and what it enabled us to do was to have really crystal clear positioning as a developer platform, API first, and really search as a service. So API and search as a service were both very well known and understood by the developer community and then became more broadly known and, and understood. So. That's one of the things that we believe we got really right from the beginning. Now, the flip side of that coin um, is that you know, we went up market. So a lot of companies that start with a product-led growth motion sometimes take a while to go up market and start a sales force. We went there pretty early, and that was really good for us, for the market that we're in. However, we forgot one thing. We forgot that pricing was actually part of our product. And so we conflated this notion of pricing being part of our product and having to gate certain um, features that had applicability for all customers, but we put them and pigeonholed them just in these like enterprise plans to justify a price point. And that did a couple of things. Number one, it slowed down our feedback loop from the market. And secondarily, it kind of stifled our PLG, our product like growth business for a little while. We, we solved it, but you know, it was definitely something we'd advise people not to do based upon our own experience. Yeah, I think the transition from uh, bottoms up and product-led growth into sales is always uh, can be very fraught. 
and a lot of companies have difficulty uh, navigating those waters. So I don't think you're alone. Yep, I think you're right. I think from my perspective, maybe I'll share our first few years because I came from a very bootstrap and, and kind of operational background. And when we started the company, we knew exactly what is the pain that we are solving. And we were growing aside our customers from day one. But from the other hand, when we were uh, speaking with investors, we had really hard times to convince them that this is a real problem and a real need. And I think that the main thing is that they went and asked the CEOs of the company, do you have any issues with your global payroll? They said, no, everything is great. I don't have any issues at all. And they came back and like, I mean, I don't see the problem. I mean, everything is going very smoothly. And I was constantly telling them, you're not asking the right person, right? I mean, the people that are working behind the scene to make it happen, I mean, those are the one that you should ask. And I think for us, the first three years was really years of very rapid growth uh, without getting, uh, I would say, the market support uh, from investor side. Um, but uh, I'm, I think in reality, I mean, sometimes you are just uh, coming from the industry and, and you know things a bit before the investors understand the market or the problems. Uh, so th this, this is a good advice for me, for everyone else that is kind of expert in this domain. Uh, I mean, if you feel that there is a real problem, if you are coming from the field, don't give up. <laughs> One thing that uh, I think we've worked for us that we've we had very shallow technology. We didn't, uh, we didn't develop a lot of the technology, almost duct taped something that looked like a product. We almost faked it. And uh, we, we did have, you know, it was working, but uh, we, we gathered together whatever we could find on the internet, components that we could uh, put together, and we charged early. And again, we're, we didn't need the money. We just wanted to know that we have something that people are willing to pay for. So that was, uh, a good decision in a hindsight. Uh, just duct tape something, don't sweat the technology too much, see what people want and need and are willing to pay for, and then, then you could build it. So Amit, a question to you. So what are the lessons that you can share with early uh, founder, early startup founders uh, trying to currently uh, start their own companies uh, on cloud side uh, for them to be successful? This is uh, this would be my fourth downturn, 2000, 2008, 2020, and, and um, 2022. Um, you know, it's helpful to think of in terms of like your, your mission for, for decades, right? This is a natural cycle that happens like every now and then, like every few years. It could be like now it's like every two years, but uh, it could be like every uh, uh, eight or 10 years and not worry about it too much. Of course, make sure that you have cash, right? Cash is... Without cash, it's a lot harder, but assume that you have that. So focus on the mission, the value to create for customers, uh, make sure that the value proposition is in line with uh, what's top of mind for people right now. It's more on, maybe on, on efficiency and, and do more with less versus like grow some of the things that we've seen like uh, about a year ago. You, you worked on a product for two years just to launch a beta and then like uh, a couple more years, um, uh, to actually start uh, charging and selling and you're growing. Tell us about, you know, your, your thinking and, and your learning from that experience. Yeah, uh, so many thoughts. And, and by the way, I'll just start by saying there's lots of ways to start up. And so I don't think that there's like one right path and uh, tons of respect for what you're doing and you. And so uh, nothing here should be taken as like a, a counterpoint to that. Um, for us, we started in August 2012, uh, kind of figured out what we're doing around June 2013. I launched our closed beta December 2015. Our GA release October 2016. Didn't make our first dollar until summer 2017. Uh, and so it's quite uh, the journey. And I think I'd probably advise people to not do that and to make money faster and to you know get the thing out there faster. Uh, for us, it took a long time because we were building something that had a big moat. It was something technologically that hadn't been done before. Um, and you know I'm excited and glad that we have that moat. But in contrast, when we started working on FigJam, our second product, uh, which we launched in April of 2021, you know, FigJam is a whiteboarding product uh, for ideation, brainstorming, and we were hearing a lot of need for that during the pandemic. And so it was uh, something we talked a lot about with the team was, hey, we got to get this out there before the pandemic ends because we need to help our users now. Uh, and I think that that urgency really translated into a fast development cycle ended up being probably like eight months or so to build that in contrast to five years. 
uh, and then another year from there to monetize it. So, um, or actually a little bit less, like eight, nine months or so to monetize. And so I'm, I'm glad we're moving faster now. And I try to instill that in the rest of the team too, that you know, perfect is the enemy of the good. Uh, and just getting it out there. The beautiful thing about software is that you can keep improving it. We're not shipping couches or chairs uh, or you put it out there once and then you're stuck with it forever. And so I, I feel very lucky to work in Bits, not Atoms. Love that. You know, on the topic of go-to-market engines and pricing, I'm curious if anyone has lessons selling into this increasingly hybrid world that we're in now. I think for me, selling on a remotely and on a hybrid world means two things. First, making, making things very, very easy. So try to create a very transparent, very easy pricing. I think that when, when you are overcomplicated at pricing, when it takes a lot of stages to get to a, a price proposal, you actually lose your, your audience. And also, I mean, eventually, I mean, it takes more time to, to go from uh, just the prospect to the onboarding stage. Um, but I think that the second thing, which is much more important, is that you have to assure that you sell the product by the product. And I think I have two great examples here, Figma and Gong, which uh, we, we, we use internally in Papaya. And I think that if you have someone that loves the product when they see it, they are the buyer. They want to they wanna make it happen. They are your ambassador to assure that you are getting in that you are going through all of the barriers. It can be legal, it can be pricing, and so on. So don't sell over a presentation, sell over the product. Assure that people can see the product, can touch the product. I mean, be proud of the product. I think, I mean, for me, if I go to a sales call and I see a presentation or PowerPoint, I mean, the first reaction is kind of stepping backwards because I, I lose kind of the trust that I have. I want to see the product. I want to understand what is it for me. Yeah, so I joined Algolia back in May of 2020, so in the first wave of the pandemic, really. And so the beauty of you know, an API-first platform is it can solve many different search use cases, for example, for our customers. But I felt that we needed to get to repeatability one use case at a time, and that's often a challenge that any platform out there um, will face. I know I've faced that challenge back, you know, going back to 2010, last 12 years, only having experience with platforms. So we, we, we followed that philosophy and obviously given the time uh, with COVID and everything, it was a no brainer to pick B2C e-commerce. So we instantiated that with a sales play. It became a cross-functional effort. It has to become a cross-functional effort in order to be successful. And um, it's given us great results. So now we, we keep going with that um, and we've got, a, we've got a cadence every quarter. So it works really, really well for us. I've got a question for the group. Every SaaS company, it's in our DNA to be customer obsessed. I'd love to hear from, from some of you on how that manifests itself in your go-to-market strategies. I think it's worth thinking outside of go-to-market as it's traditionally defined for this one. Uh, for example, in the early days of Figma, I tried to encourage our support team to think of themselves as marketing. Uh, you know, I was like, hey, if someone's writing into you and they have like a very long uh, ticket full of feedback, build a relationship. Like you're basically our evangelist right now. And a lot of those people that then uh, had all that feedback later on became evangelists. Of course, some of them became trolls as well. So I'm ignoring the trolls there. But, uh, but for the most part, it was uh, very helpful to just deeply engage with customers and really build up community and I think you can build a community in lots of ways, not just through go-to-market marketing. Right. We, we call it at Gong, we call it, uh, we, we're not saying we're obsessed. We want raving fans, right? And we said there, we don't want happy customers. That's kind of the uh, table stakes. We want like raving fans. And, and uh, this is the marketing, right? The understanding, no, not just doing it. But first, it's fun, but we're doing it actually uh, because this is the marketing. We believe that the mess marketing is like customer spreading the gospel, right? We're we're a new thing, a new category. The world doesn't even know we exist, uh, doesn't know why you need something like Gong, and we wanted to rely on raving fans, which by the way, we extend both to employees. We want like uh, candidates, which are, are prospective uh, employees, employees, customers, and prospective customers. Everybody that has interaction with customer, we want like to rave uh, about the company, and then when we succeed, that's what we, uh, that's what we celebrate, and that is our, our best marketing. I will say for product-led growth companies and companies with self-serve, uh, it's so important to 
deeply understand all the mechanics of how it works uh, and to also understand what metrics will affect other metrics down the road. Because um, it's very possible to miss over here and then three months later you're missing over here and it's actually just one miss. Uh, and so uh, really being hardcore about that and tracking everything and then being super diligent with your team if you have a miss, uh, I think is super important. Yeah, so I, I'd like to ask the group as a CEO of a global HR and payroll uh, platform, uh, I can't help myself and ask you and wonder what is for your, um, in your perspective, a best place to work means currently in these days? What makes it a, a great company for employees to work? Uh, what benefits matters? Uh, I'd be very happy to hear your perspective. You, you know, I, I think especially on a call like this where we're across the world uh, and in very different areas of technology, I think it's important to note that there is such a thing as like culture market fit uh, in terms of company culture and how that matches to the market you're serving. Uh, I don't think that there's one answer to this question. And I think, you know, for Figma, for example, some of the things we think a lot about are how do you create like a playful spirit when you come to work? How do you have fun um, and make it a really enjoyable experience to be here so we can all be creative together? And so we do things like Maker Weeks where we have the entire company gather and come together for a week to really be innovative. Um, other companies probably would, you know, really not, not have that same reaction to those things or they might be annoyed. Uh, you know, if that was the approach and culture that they experienced. And so um, I think there's lots of different ways to, to work together um, as a company. And, and again, not just one way to start up. All right. I think it's like, uh, it's, it's easy to state. Uh, it's not always uh, easy to, uh, to practice. But uh, what you try first, people want like a sense of uh, uh, purpose, right? That they believe in what the company uh, does. They have room for growth. They are trusted. They have uh, uh, freedom to operate. They have the right environment and set up and, uh, and they can shine and, and blossom. This is like, uh, and, and work feels more like, like joy than, uh, th than a chore. Uh, now you gotta make sure that you have like the right team in place, the right, uh, the right infrastructure and, and really a, a, a good cause that everybody uh, uh, rallies around. But uh, it, it boils down to this like purpose, empowerment and, and self uh, fulfillment. You know, I often think in pictures, so I have a, I have a triangle in my, in my head right now, um, sort of three layers, and I, I look at the bottom layer as the table stakes. Yes, that's comp and benefits and rewards, but that's not what, the, it's just what it says, it's table stakes. It's not what you're going to differentiate on. You differentiate on, in my opinion, the, your employee value proposition, which is some of the things like Amit was saying, it's sort of your values, it's really your contract with not, not physical legal contracts, it's your commitment to your employees as to what your environment and their environment is going to be like to work in, whether it's physical or virtual or hybrid or, or whatever. But it's, it's governed a lot by your values um, and care and humility and trust and you know, things like that that are you know, specific to, to each of us. And then on top, going to the purpose element, that's unique and it's that's that's you know for, we actually simplify it because I could never get my head around vision mission uh, purpose it was all too much um, so we said it's the one thing for all of us you know our goal for example is powering discovery our vision our mission we're doing it today there's so much more that we want to do and yes it is our reason for being so I, I that's how I think of it is table stakes but then differentiate on the employee value proposition and your vision and you know people can buy into it and relate to it and join or choose not to and that's okay I heard something nice recently that actually a successful company you take this triangle and it should be upside down because leadership should be kind of the on the bottom of it and when if you're building the company successfully so actually I mean the leadership is just kind of the the point that holds it but the whole of our team is the one that really creates the value and can grow and blossom, as Amit said. So I, I, I really agree to that. Inet, uh, I know that you're really passionate about social impact uh, and just generally doing good in the world. And I'd love to hear more about what informed those viewpoints, how they manifest for your company, but also what you think the role of capitalism is and uh, should every company be participating in this sort of social impact and, and what are the bounds of that? Yeah, so it's really one of the topics that I'm really passionate about because I think that as CEOs, as founders, companies, we have a rare opportunity not only to 
create great businesses, but also to leave a mark in the world. And I also always want to be in a place where I can come home at the end of the day and tell my kids that I contribute a bit to a better world for them. And for us in Papaya, it's really kind of see how we bring more and more people uh, from different backgrounds, from different kind of uh, places to be part of this journey. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think uh, when you look at some of your core values sort of guide how, how you look at these things, care is one of our core values. And, you know, we support many different and diverse, both social and humanitarian causes. And we do that um, employee driven uh, through a matching program, charitable matching program, which is good. But I think now we're sort of um, being more intentional about how we go about leaving a mark, a positive mark on the world. And so we're taking what we've focused on historically around, you know, a carbon offset program uh, that was very loosely sort of administered and really now double downing on, doubling down, I should say, on, you know, becoming net zero. We're exploring the idea of becoming net zero by 2030 and doing it in such a way that it is, um, it's provable, it's permanent, and you can, you know, you can validate it. Uh, I'm grateful that we have like inspiration and leaders like uh, CEOs like uh, Bernadette and Anat that provide inspiration to a new generation that can uh, see themselves and also with the underrepresented uh, uh, representative minorities. So we're pretty active and uh, in, in uh, dozens of ways and I think that every company that does that makes this world uh, like, you know, slightly better and if we all do it, it'll, it'll be a lot better. Uh, the uh, other thing that we started to do that I'm really excited about is more unique to Figma is Figma and Chromebook. Um, we just did a partnership with Chromebook where any school district in the United States and hopefully uh, even more broad than that later on can just press a button and then deploy Figma to all the Chromebooks in their district. And really excited to see how this impacts high schoolers and, and kids that are, are on the younger side um, as they go and grow um, uh, into their careers. Uh, you know, I certainly didn't know that design was a viable career option when I was in high school or middle school. Uh, I hope that the next uh, generation can actually see that as a, a great path forward, especially as we have so few designers in the world and there's such a huge demand, I think, for, across all of our companies uh, to find and attract more designers right now. So question to the group. There is an old cliche that the best tech companies are, has started in days like this of a downturn of the markets. Uh, so if you need to currently give your best advice to early startup founders about where they need to put their best efforts, what are the areas that they need to kind of double down, what would it be? I, I think it's a lot of the same lessons that we've had in the past uh, with the addition of, you know, be really concerned in your cash. Don't assume that if you raise, you're going to be able to raise again. Uh, and I think um, by being conservative like that, you'll build an efficient and focused business that's very on mission and targeted. Uh, and that's, I think, a really good predictor of success later on as well as you scale your business and grow. So if you're listening in your early stage, best of luck. Uh, we're all rooting for you. Right. I, I agree. I mean, you need to watch the cash, but hopefully you have uh, enough. Customers have, have needs, like everybody have needs, right? They're, they're different. Find them and, and you can succeed in a big way. You hear a lot of talk at the moment as well with regards to you've got to ruthlessly prioritize. That's the name of the game. It's not as easy as it sounds. It's easy to say it. It's not quite as easy to do it. And so what's interesting is I think that the, the flaw in that notion of ruthlessly prioritizing is that that's a very one-dimensional. People typically think of that in terms of a list. It doesn't give you a lot of options to, um, you know, to, to, to think in a multi-dimensional way. So I think you need at least two axes. You know, what's the effort it's going to take and what's the impact it's going to have? And plot and figure out which ones you're not even going to bother with right now. So you know, I, I think there's a lot of lip service to ruthless prioritization. Um, I think we need to talk about the fact that it's not that easy in reality when you get a group of people because of the competing um, you know, vantage points that they may have. So I think having a framework that helps you with that is sort of a step in the right direction. And I think that's going to be really important moving forward. I would just add to this that I think 
I would double down in everything that beat the metrics. So take the metrics and understand how do you beat them and double down there. So it can be, I mean, the cost of customer acquisition that should be super efficient. It can be eventually the ARR. It can be any metrics that matters in the business. But assure that you have all of the efforts and uh, that, that you can double down and eventually be the best in class. Thanks all for this awesome conversation. Really good to see you all. Uh, congrats again on the Cloud 100. Hope you all well. Great seeing you everyone uh, and uh, looking forward to the next time. Thanks everyone. It's been a pleasure to meet you all. Congrats on Cloud 100 and looking forward to meet you again. Love the conversation today. Thanks very much indeed and uh, congrats on Cloud 100 again.